uh, my name is Marcel. I work for the uh, Intel Open Source. Sorry, Intel Open Source Technology Center, and uh, I, this is a really short one. I give on something that is pretty much that I call L Run, which is a small pet project of mine. It's pretty much something trying to get this a little bit more into a more usable state for other people. So. Uh, before I get to what it is, it originated out of Test Runner, and probably nobody knows about this. Test Runner was a pretty much another script. I had to do it in C. It was a tool that I could just then start random kernels uh, with my current file system and just test it if something worked or doesn't work, or run a unit test or an automated test or something else. It is pretty much something, um, I don't pretty much, I think people recognize that movie, right? No? Come on. It's Inception. So it's pretty much. Uh, you have your, uh, you have your uh, build your kernel, you wrote your tool, or uh, um, anything else you have modified, but you need to run this in a kernel. So the options you're going to have, you either boot that kernel, you run it inside a KVM, or you do something other than else, and which takes a lot of time. And time is the one thing that really annoyed me that to waste there. So this was pretty much a wrap around uh, KVM or QEMO, and then it pretty much spawns itself again, starts itself up as init, and sets everything up, and then drops me back into the shell and the location I currently was. So at the end of the day, I was running inside uh, a new kernel, but with my current system that I had been running, so I could just quickly test out oh, if this actually kernel patch works, or I did a user modification that I needed a different kernel, I didn't want to boot that kernel on the system because I have other things to do there, and so on and so forth. I didn't want to put in an extra system. Um, from a command line, it was pretty much simple. So it was written for Bluezy, for the uh, Bluetooth support, uh, and I just give it the kernel image that I've built, and then I give it a bash, and then I'm back there. You could have any other uh, tool or anything else, um, but it just runs it, and I got back to where I needed to be. Kind of interesting if you want to actually bisect something because you have found an issue or something else, you just can run this multiple times, and you can build this up. So what it really does, it first of all starts KVM with a bunch of options, because if you want to set up KVM manually, you need probably like 20 or 30 options to get this every working, and everybody knows this. Most people script this, um, but then you move that script on a different machine, you have it somewhere else, you can't remember this one, then you need to have to tweak a little bit because that's different. So I wanted something where I can start KVM for me and make this work. Especially if you have like, if you do nested virtualization because you're already running a virtualization, make sure it does the optimal speed and so on and so forth. Um, it uses plan nine resource sharing, so it's a file system uh, from uh, old days where pretty much you can pass through the host file system into your uh, guest, which is kind of nice. It starts itself, so once you actually start it, it forked itself again and became PID1. But then you had nothing there, you needed to do something else. So it sets up the basic file system, uh, it mounts the different uh, extra partitions that you need and so on and so forth. Uh, it does process management, because once you're PID1, you have to do process management. If you want to start anything else, you actually need to manage something and figure out when it terminates so you actually can clean up uh, after you. Uh, cleaning up KVMs is actually kind of nasty in some certain situations, so you actually have to do this the right way. Um, interesting things for most things I do is testing, I needed to have a dbus setup. So I need to spawn dbus daemon, but to do this I can't use the one on the system because of different privileges, different setups. So it has to actually mount the configuration files as in tempfs, create the file system, for, uh, create the files for this one, set this all up, or get the right permissions, and so on and so forth. Something I don't want to keep doing all over again, it did it just for me. Then if for the Bluetooth testing where I initially wrote this, um, it needs to start the daemon because with a couple of test cases I just wanted to run the daemon. <laughs> Again, needs another configuration setup, needs to uh, have the right permissions, and so on and so forth. Have to make sure that Dbus is started first, then you start the daemon, and so on and so forth. And then a couple of other tools that you needed to get going and make working. So it did all that for me, and then I could just actually write my uh, unit test and then run this. Uh, in some cases, then, you need also files, uh, device setup. So with Bluetooth, I needed a virtual device or pass-through. Uh, so it sets up all of that one. I could even have the device emulated in the host or in the guest and everything set up so I can pretty much just run the test quickly. So as you might have realized, on this is all pretty much Bluetooth specific. But it served as well a purpose. Um, I thought, well, nobody needs this anyway. It's just a teeny tiny pet project. It works there. We can use it. We can utilize it and so on and so forth. So about five years ago, we started uh, uh, IWD, the new Wi-Fi daemon for Linux, which I'm probably giving a talk in about an hour or so. Um, we ended up having the same needs. We need more testing, we need more unit tests, we need to run this, and we don't want to waste any time. Um, the guys working on the project fork test runner and made it completely Wi-Fi specific. The code base doesn't look alike. You might see some resembles. It is called the same. It works completely different. Uh, besides starting KVM, it's a different beast. It starts KVM with different options and so on and so forth. 
mainly because it has is targeted at a test suite. It has a HW SIM setup. It needs to run start host APD with uh, 30 million different configurations. It does physical PCI pass through since most uh, Wi-Fi cards are PCI, not USB or something else. Um, and it actually has extra logging information that needs to get back to the host. So completely different. So about uh, I think three or four months ago, I said, okay, we, we need to actually get this unified because I don't want to maintain two code bases. So um, instead of calling it test runner, which is, which is an awful name. Uh, I called it LRun, um, so that you can actually run a Linux kernel uh, inside, a, inside your environment and then do their testing. Um, I stepped away from KVM and KMO for a bit. Um, because even if you have a fast system and a fast machine, it still takes a lot of time to set this up. Even with all the modern tricks that we have done with Clear Linux and all the other works, um, it still takes me too much time if I want to run something. Um, so I went back to something really old called user mode Linux. Um, anybody remembers this one? I think it's pretty much died out. Uh, it got back a little bit in the last couple of uh, months or so where I said some extra new features. Um, it actually works pretty well. And if you don't need any specific timing or actually real hardware access, it's awesome. It's a lot faster. So instead of uh, plan 9 FS, you use uh, host FS, you get shared access to your file system, you get back where you need it. Uh, and then I said, okay, look, I can't have this all splitting up, hacking the uh, configuration parameters for everything into the uh, uh, source code. I need some sort of uh, configuration setup. Initially, I thought I can use just uh, systemd units, point them to the units of the demons that I want to start, extract the parts that I need off of this one, and then start them up. It doesn't really work this way. Systemd is way too smart for this one uh, and has way too many options. And if I would end up doing this one, I would re-implant systemd from the scratch. So I pretty took the ba uh, basic ideas out of uh, system unit files so that you actually have some basic uh, uh, options that you can use and you're familiar with, and then you can uh, point this at your uh, L run uh, binary and then it starts up the needed things you need. Um, the process manager has to got a lot smarter and in more details to actually get uh, certain things working, especially since we have ported most of the demons over to more advanced configuration settings and more uh, hardening support uh, for security purposes. So it needs to have a lot of more work to do to set this up. You cannot just start daemon and hope everything works fine. So this is how this actually looks like. If you're in a simple case, you just start L run. Uh, it will find uh, an image in your current uh, directory and it will just boot it. Ignore the error on the second line that's a user mode Linux bug. I haven't really figured out how to fix this, even if you give it the right buffer. Um, but what it pretty much does is it actually boots up, starts a file system, mounts a file system, creates the extra files, etc., and then drops you in the shell. So later on the bottom you see if you do an ID, you are root now. And if you do uh, a uname minus A, you actually are on a, a 5.3 kernel now. This was running do on a 4.2 Fedora kernel uh, straightforward. So drops you right into your uh, testing kernel that I was building there. Um, I can do my test, I do control D, I'm back out, I can compile again, and it's pretty much fast. Um, you can give it, if you want to do a little bit more smart, you can give it a configuration file. Um, the kernel command line options is pretty much important because the previous are all hacked in, so I cannot tell them, okay, give me certain command line options and it just passes this through to the uh, um, user mode Linux start, which is kind of nice. Uh, for the Wi-Fi testing, we always need to uh, silence the radios because otherwise I have to start deleting them after I boot it. Um, the standard kernel decides to start with two virtual radios, which is kind of annoying because they're always in the way. For the Bluetooth testing on a Bluetooth security vulnerability, I had to add a couple of options that are disabled, kind of nice as well, and just give this option and uh, deactivate it. Um, if you want to have some logging, because it actually starts, it creates a run shared directory where you get the log files back into your host file system. So you can run this uh, virtual machine and then it starts writing me in this file system and then you get this back in your host file system and you can view the log, which is kind of neat if you actually have to do, uh, see what's going on and it's pretty much automated. You can do this with any kind of logging as well. And uh, I probably have to make this configurable, the shared directory, but uh, uh, this uh, is uh, for the current workflow. Um, if you want to start a virtual, uh, uh, Bluetooth uh, interfaces, it pretty much uh, starts at, okay, start me two of them, uh, and then it tells you what daemon to start, and then you are uh, uh, pretty much it. It only has to tell you, start the logging first before you start the uh, uh, daemon, and that's about it. Uh, for the tricky part, uh, you actually have to also give it uh, the dbus things. If you want to actually do testing on dbus, it has to actually just start the dbus, so I utilize this in uh, socket activation, and then starting uh, uh, the dbus broker as well on that one. Um, it's all part of the embedded Linux library. Um, the main reason for this is one for us, this is the main uh, core functionality that we're going to have. It contains everything that we need 
all our communications daemon don't need anything else. They just need this library because it, it contains Netlink, Dbus, and everything else support. So we don't have this uh, massive uh, amount of uh, dependencies when we have to build anything. Um, nice thing is um, when we actually do this, it, we can use user mode time travel, uh, time travel mode, time travel mode, which is kind of neat. So every time the system is not doing anything, it jumps forward, which is great if you just have to wait 10 seconds for a timeout because that turns into pretty much uh, zero time. So unit test and testing tools run really faster. Uh, it kind of works, uh, the configuration of this one is a little bit nasty and I hope um, maybe we can extend this a little bit and making this more uh, fine grained to switch it on and off uh, at a given time. Um, so I have to figure out how to do this. Uh, Dbus broker still doesn't fully work, uh, mainly because it relies on uh, having a journal active and socket activation fully working. So. With Dbus daemon, you can just start it because that does everything for you. Dbus broker needs a lot of work. It has to be pretend to be running in a systemd environment. So that's a little bit of I have to still add to this one to pretend to be at least a basic systemd environment for a bunch of tools to work. Um, we have to do this for ourselves anyway because we switched for uh, IWD uh, to all the uh, security hardening uh, options. So uh, where the configurations file lives, where the state directory lives, etc. So that eventually at some point we can, uh, can run with dynamic user uh, to spawn of a in a separate user every time the daemon starts. Um, so that needs a little bit of extra work, but no, it's not too much. <coughs> I want to port KVM and QMO support that we had in test run back to this one. So if you say, okay, I actually want to run this in KVM, um, you can, uh, mainly because you have some uh, PCI hardware that you want to pass through, or you have some USB hardware that you want to pass through, or something else. Um, user mode, mode Linux has a patch for USB pass through. Uh, it doesn't compile anymore, it doesn't work anymore, and I think it's a lot of extra work to actually get that one back into a usable state so someone can use it. Uh, PCI, uh, I think that's a no-go on uh, the user mode Linux side. Um, I also played a little bit with namespaces, so if you don't need a new kernel, you just need your clean environment where your configuration files and state files, etc., live, because you don't want to override your current usage of your daemon, um, namespaces would be probably enough. Um, you can achieve something similar with systemd run, um, I have to toy with this one, but I think it gives you a nice thing to test this quickly with a, a pre-built uh, configuration environment or if you have some uh, uh, other tests around that actually uh, just need uh, a different environment instead of just a new kernel. Um, what I really want to do is uh, get to the level where we can just say, look, uh, it's nice for you the small testing, but you need a more complex system so that we can actually just uh, spawn, uh, have a basic setup as PID1 and then give system the full control to actually keep running and say, look, Here's your files. Uh, we have built a minimal uh, service unit files for you. Please start them, execute them in order, and then uh, you have system be up and running. This would solve the problem with uh, having to emulate everything for Dbus broker, etc. It doesn't fully work yet. Uh, I think I'm going to make this working uh, eventually. Uh, maybe we need to do a couple of patches for systemd. But there would be a nice thing. We can just drop it into a new kernel, start system be up and running. Then you have something like the uh, systemd end spawn, but you actually have it with a different kernel instead of just namespaces. Um, I want to do batch processing of unit tests as well, uh, pretty much to integrate this with git bisect. So if you have a couple of issues somewhere, if you just start it, go here. Here's the, uh, here's the uh, source code of your Linux kernel, figure this out, build it, and tell me which kernel version fails, so it actually starts running all of this one. Instead, you have to do this a lot of manual things, uh, which is, uh, this will obviously not be fast, it will take, still uh, take some time, but I don't want to put this on a system where I have to do this. Uh, uh, manually all the time. So this is something uh, I'm currently working on as well. And that's pretty much for the small uh, pet project of mine. Um, so, questions? Uh, so when you're doing, uh, using QMU, you will support cross-compilation and uh, things as well? So, um, no. The reason for this one is pretty much uh, because I'm dropping in my current system that has all my current binaries. So if I would drop this in a PowerPC kernel on x86, all your binaries are kind of gone. It defeats a little bit the purpose. For that one, you'd have to have a, a system that you uh, have pre-built and that you have to give it as a file system. So with HostFS and uh, Plan 9, uh, 9 PFS sharing, it doesn't make any sense. Would be great if you could do this, but then you had multi-binary things where you have multiple versions of your code in it. So, no, that we don't support. I'm not going to, by the way. <laughs> sure. Um, have you, I, I understand that this project is kind of um, helping you with continuous integration of, of kernel drivers? Yeah. Um, have you had a look at um, the built-in kernel functions um, to track branch and code coverage in the Linux kernel? No, I haven't. 
I s highly recommend yeah. you do. Um, I built a similar system yeah. some time ago, and it gives you basically code coverage of your tests awesome. in, in your kernel. I'm going to have a look at this. This is more for while you're developing. You want to just quickly jump in the kernel, test if your change works, and jump back. That was the main goal for this one, not something like more extensive. But I will going to have a look at this one and see if I can make use of it. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you.